Okay, our Devar Torah for Parshas Vayeshe. And maybe if we have some time, we'll connect it to Hanukkah as well. Parshas Vayeshe, the, the title of the Devar Torah for today is Wardrobe Changes. Um, and I think that uh, part, the observation that I'd like to make is that so much of the story of Yosef uh, contains descriptions of wardrobes, contains descriptions of different kinds of clothing. Um, the Yisrael Ahabis Yosef Mikol Vanov Kiven Zikunim Hulo Vaasolo Ksones Pasim, first passage. The first time that we are introduced to Yaakov's relationship to Yosef, it is in terms of the clothing that Yaakov gave to Yosef. A coat of many colors, or however you're going to explain what the term ketonet pasim means, a tunic that was pasim, which usually is translated of many colors, the way Rashi explains it. And then the whole treachery of the brothers is also described in terms of a garment. That when the brothers came upon Yosef and they conspired to get rid of him, they removed his coat of many colors. And of course, we know that they dipped it in blood and they showed it to their father. There's so much imagery revolving this garment as far as the story of Yosef. That's the first wardrobe of Yosef that we're introduced to. So, you know, the, the first scene of Yosef is Yosef in his technicolor dream coat, okay? Second wardrobe that we learn of Yosef is Yosef as the slave in the house of Potiphar and how that garment also is very much a part of the story of his being in the house of Potiphar. And we know that because sort of the, the end of that episode of Yosef's life ends with a garment. When the wife of Potiphar is Vatit Pesehu Bivigdole Mor Shikva Imi, Vayazov Bigda Biada, Bigdo Biada, Vayonos Vayetse Achutza. That when she wants to be intimate with Yosef, he is so petrified and terrified of himself that he immediately leaves her with his garment. And the way that the Medrash explains it, the Medrash actually connects this, that in some way it was very similar to Yosef's Kesonis Pasim in one, in one feature. It says, Melamed, the Medrash is source number four from Seichel Tov. The Medrash says, Melamed shahaya bigdo ha'elyon patuach milafanav shahaya lavush kemo ha'rochvim. It seems like it was a coat that was open in the front, like a jacket, right? Like a blazer that has buttons in the front. Um, like riders, it seems like, I guess, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I guess the riders of the time of the Medrash would wear a jacket with buttons or clasps in the front. Kemosha amor al kesonis ha-pasim. And that's the same way that the ketonet pasim was constructed. Vihitov sato me'achorav v'hu hitir halula'ot min ha-kerasim. So what did he do? She grabbed him from the back the back of his garment, like he was trying to get away from her, she grabs the back of his garment, and all he does is unbuttons the buttons and lets the garments come off of him, right? So that's the way the Medrash is describing it. And the Medrash actually re is connecting the garment that he's wearing as a slave in Potiphar's house to the garment that he wore at the Ketonis Pasim. Is it just a coincidence? I don't think so. The third wardrobe is not as apparent because we don't read about the garb that Yosef wore when he was in prison. But nevertheless, Vayikach Adonai Yosef Oto, Vayitnei Ol Beit HaSohar Mekom Asher Asirei HaMelech Asurim, Vayihisham Beveit HaSohar. That Yosef is taken and placed in a prison where the prisoners of the king are imprisoned. And that's where he was, and he was in the prison. Now, the Chizkuni says something very interesting. First of all, he points out that Asurei HaMelech Ketiv Asirei Kari. You read it as Asurei, and you read it as Asirei. What's the difference between the two? He doesn't really tell us, but if you take a look at the next words of the commentary, 
it seems that he's alluding to something very subtle. The word asir means a prisoner, but asur means someone who is being in some way constrained. V'nim tzaba agada, the Medrash tells us, sheheviu Yosef lifnei hamelech, that when they brought Yosef after the accusation of the Mrs. Potiphar, they bring him before the king, ba Gavriel kidmut ish, the angel Gabriel disguises himself as a man, vayomer im alamelech tov yitzabel livdok bevig dehem, he says, your honor, if it is, uh, if it, if it, if it appeases you, if it pleases you, then check the clothing of the accused. Im bigdei ha'isha nikraim biadua shehechazik ba Yosef la onsa. The im bigdei Yosef nikraim hechazika he la onso. Let's see who was the aggressor and who was the victim. And how do you tell? You tell through their clothing. Look at the forensics of the scene of the crime. If Yosef's, if her, Mrs. Potiphar's clothing is torn, then Yosef is the aggressor, aggressor and she's the victim. And if his clothes are torn, then she's the aggressor and he's the victim. I mean, talk about hashtag me too. I mean, this is, wow. This is very uh, contemporary, wouldn't you say? Okay? In other words, Gavriel comes along and says, you don't automatically believe one over the other. It's not automatic. Boy, what an interesting drusha this would make, right? Very, very non-PC, wouldn't you say? Yeah? What do you mean by PC? Politically correct. Okay. Okay. Vayivukash hadavar vayimatse, shehayu bigde Yosef keruim. And so they looked at the forensics, they looked at the evidence, and they discovered that Yosef's clothing was torn. Uvishvil kach lo danuhu lahariga. And that's why they did not judge him to be executed. Because normally, in ancient Egypt, if you even attempted to uh, rape uh, the wife of your master, that was, of course, grounds for execution immediately. I mean, just think about uh, slavery in the South in the 19th century. Of course, that was like a given, right? And but they couldn't let him go scot-free because if they would let, if they would release him, then that would be damning to Mrs. Potiphar, and it would be a great humiliation. And of course, the courts could not allow that to happen. And the Chizkuni concludes by saying, "The Kohanei Mitzrayim danu din zeh, v'lachen lo kana Yosef admatam b'shnei hara'avon." Isn't this interesting? Because the priests of Mitzrayim were the ones who exonerated Yosef from the death penalty, he showed gratitude to them by not confiscating their property. At the end of Parsha's Fayigash, uh, when we read about Yosef's land, uh, you know, the, social, the, the socialization of Egypt by all land reverting to the government, right? The great socialist project of Yosef was that all land reverted to the government in times of famine, but we give an exemption to the religious leaders. And the Chizkuni says that the reason why Yosef granted this exemption to the Kohanim of Mitzrayim is because they were the ones who came to the conclusion that he was not guilty. And how do you see this in the Korean Mixer? So it would seem, it's not clear. You know, you're right, it's not clear. But Asur would, if you read the word Asur instead of Asir, Perhaps what it means to say is, is that he was the one who was falsely, uh, falsely incriminated. He was a prisoner, but Asur means that perhaps on some other level he, was not, he did not deserve to be incriminated. And maybe that's what the word Asur means. In other words, it was forbidden for them to let him go because they didn't want to incriminate Mrs. Potiphar but really they knew that he was innocent. Maybe that's what it means. It's not really clear from the Chizkuni. But the point is, is that there's two different levels. He was a prisoner, 
but not because he was really guilty, but rather because they couldn't free him uh, because otherwise it would incriminate Mrs. Potiphar. So once again, clothing, Yosef goes through a wardrobe change. He's no longer wearing the clothing of an Evid in the house of Potiphar, but he's wear, now wearing a prisoner's clothes and ends up in prison because of clothing. The fourth wardrobe change is two years later, or actually probably a dozen years later, because according to the measure, she was in prison for 10 years, and then another two years after the dreams of the Sar HaMashkim and the Sar HaOfim. And it says, Vayishlach paro vayikrat Yosef, vayiritzu min habor, vayigalach, vayichalef simlotav, vayavo el paro. Once again, Torah comments on Yosef's clothing. They pull him out of prison, and he's got to shave and change his clothes. So another wardrobe change, no longer a prisoner, but now someone who is wearing the clothing of someone who must appear before Paro as a dream interpreter. And then finally, the fifth wardrobe change is Vayosar Paro is Tabatome al Yado. This is the next in uh, Parshas Miketz. That Paro removes his signet uh, from off of his hand, you know, his signet ring. He places it on Yosef's hands, clothes him in big day sheish, in fine silk garments, and places the revid hazahav, this type of, of uh, golden necklace or mantle, upon his neck. Now he's the viceroy of all of Egypt. So Yosef has gone through five wardrobe changes. We see him on the first scene of his life in the Ketonet Pasim. Second scene of his life, we see him wearing the clothes of an Evid of the wife of, uh, of, uh, of Potiphar, which is also part of the very part and parcel of the story. The third scene, he's stripped of that clothing and now wears the clothing of a convicted criminal. The fourth wardrobe, he is wearing the clothing of a dream interpreter to appear before Paro. And finally, the fifth and final wardrobe change is that he is now the viceroy of Egypt. And all of these are documented in some way in the Torah. So clothing is quite relevant. Now, look, look at something very interesting. In Parshas Miketz, which we're going to read in a week from now, the Torah says, that when the brothers appeared before Yosef and he sits them all down at the table, in source number nine, from Perak Memheich, Pasach of Beis, Lechulam Natan Leish Laish Chalifot Simalot. To all of the brothers, he gave changes of clothing. Ulevin Yamin Natan Shalosh Meot Kesef, Vechamesh Chalifot Simalot. But to Binyamin, he gives 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. Now, the Gemara, at one, one opinion in the Gemara, is critical of Yosef for showing favoritism to Binyamin. Because Yosef should have learned the lesson from what his father did to him when he showed him favoritism by giving him a ketonet pasim, that this creates jealousy. But there's another opinion in the Gemara. The opinion of the Gemara in Masechet Megillah is Rabbi Binyamin Bar Yefet, and it's very telling that the author of this statement is named Rabbi Binyamin, because he's talking about Binyamin of the Bible. And he says this was, there was nothing wrong with this, that Yosef did what he needed to do, and it says, Remez Ramazlo, that Yosef was making an allusion to something that would happen to the line of Binyamin in the future. Sha'atid ben latzeit mimenu, malchut that there would be a descendant of Binyamin, whose name is Mordechai. Mordechai, Ish Yimini. Torah says he was descended from Binyamin. And he would, in the future, emerge from the palace of the king wearing five different types of royal garb. Shenemar u Mordechai yatsam ilifnei hamelech, that Mordechai emerged from the house of the king, Bilavush Malchus, use wearing royal clothing. And then, the, and then the Pasuk describes what that royal clothing was. Techeles, Bachur, Va'ateret Zahav Gidola, V'tachrich Butz, V'argaman. Five different types of garb that a king would wear. Okay? 
But I think, I believe, that there's another explanation. This is the Midrashic explanation to the five changes of clothing. But I think that there's another explanation to why Yosef gave Binyamin five changes of clothing. And in order for us to understand the deeper meaning of why clothing plays such a strong role in the imagery of the Yosef story, we need to understand more about Yosef and the role that he plays for Klal Yisrael. Because ultimately, Yosef is different from his brothers, inherently different. And we've spoken about this in different, in di in different uh, contexts before. Yosef is the person who must constantly be interacting with outside of the Jewish community. That is the role of Yosef. And there is a bit of Yosef in every Jewish community. It, are, it is those representatives of Klal Yisrael who must constantly pave the road for, the, for one's fellow Jews to be able to function amongst a world that contains far more than just Jews. Yosef is responsible and takes that role very, very seriously. But when you are a dignitary and a representative of the Jewish people to the non-Jewish world, you need to constantly change your clothes depending upon the role that you are called upon to play. Now the reason why this is so relevant to the concept of clothing, clothing is really a metaphor. And I want you to consider, how do you say the word garment in Hebrew? Levush is, is something that you wear. And what is the garment called itself? It can be called levush or it can be called a beged. Beged. Now, beged, what is the, when you turn beged uh, into a verb, what does it mean? To revolt, to rebel. What's the relationship between an article of clothing and a revolt or a rebellion? Clothes make man. Well, that's a nice saying, but what does that mean? What does that have to do with, with a revolt? Because when you change your clothes, that's the person you become. So you're rebelling against yourself in a certain way, against the real person. The Take a look. Of your soul, like basically, like, it's like a, the, the face you show to the world. It's a mask. It's a mask. It's a mask. What's really inside? Take a look at the Malbim. The Malbim, there's, by the way, a something called Sefer HaKarmel that was published after the Malbim wrote his Bible commentary, his commentary to Tanakh, and it collects all of the different commentaries of the Malbim and puts it into encyclopedia form. It was published sometime around the turn of the 20th century. And in, uh, in the entry for the word Beged, the Malbim writes as follows, He says, what is a bigida? A bigida, which comes from the word beged, is, a, is a, a betrayal, is really the way the Malbim describes it. It's a betrayal. Let's say a husband will betray his wife, or a wife will betray a husband. That's a bigida in Hebrew. And v'ha'evdel ben beged uven ma'al, also, how do you say a coat in Hebrew? Me'il. Me Isn't that interesting that a coat, when you put the word me'il into verb form, what is to do, what is me'ila? To violate. To go against something. For example, me'ila behekdish means that I take something that's temple property and use it for myself. I've betrayed or disgraced hekdish. So what's the difference between those two words? So he says like this, when you are bogeyed, when you are bogeyed against your friend, you are deceitful, and you only re, uh, betray him secretly. So he says that's the difference. Bigida and Mi'ila are both betrayals, but Bigida is a more covert betrayal than Mi'ila, where you reveal your betrayal to the person, which is why a Mi'ila, Mi'il is an overcoat, where a Beged can refer to a garment that's underneath the overcoat. So, but he says, Umishtatef baze im shem Beged. Do you want to know why it's connected to the word Beged, which is a garment? Uh, he says, 
Ken yit atev habogeit v'yit kaseh. He says, because that's what you do. You wear a mask when you betray someone. You smile when you face them, and then you stab them in the back when they're not looking. And that's what a begit is. We're right, we're right out of time. Let me just finish with this one idea. <laughs> the idea of Yosef's wardrobe change is all about the idea of having to constantly have a different appearance when you're speaking to the world. That's what we as the Jewish people need to do. We need to be prepared to be um, chameleons when the need arises. When it comes to dealing with our Western neighbors, we have to be um, friendly and we have to be kind and we have to be benevolent. And when dealing with another kind of entity, we have to be more aggressive and be able to rise up and show that we are a formidable force that needs to be contended with. And that's the way Yosef led his life. When we tear Kriya at the time of mourning, what are we basically trying to designate? When a person tears Kriya, of course, one of the representations of tearing Kriya is that my physical accoutrements are of no consequence now. But it also means that the masquerade is over. I cannot compose myself the way I normally do to the public. And Kriya is, I'm no longer going to wear a mask. I have to be able to display my emotions. And that's, what the reason, that's one of the reasons why we tear Kriya, to show that in a state of mourning, I'm not going to be completely composed and put together. I have to let myself have an outlet for my grief. So it's all that idea. What Yosef was giving to Binyamin by giving him five changes of clothing is telling him, you are also the son of Rachel, my brother. And as such, your role will be like mine. You will also be the dignitary of the Jewish people at some point in your history, just like Mordechai was. And so many of the descendants of Binyamin play that role, just like the descendants of Yosef play that role. We will need to change our clothes many times. Your brothers only need to change clothes once, from going from Eretz Yisrael to Golos. They only need one change of clothes because there will always remain Jews, qua Jews, in the town of Goshen, right? All they need is one change of clothes. But you and I will need to change our clothes many times because the role of Binyamin and the role of Yosef is different. And just as I've gone through five wardrobe changes, you too will as well. And many times in life we have to ask ourselves the question, Am I a Yosef, or am I one of the other brothers? Many times in life we are called upon to be a Yosef, and that's what we have to remember. More to discuss, but we're out of time. Have a good week. We'll see you, Mr. Shem. We'll talk about Hanukkah next time. <laughs>